Urinary Catheters, Part 3, Complications and Catheter Skills. We are going to discuss an overview of catheter complications as well as catheter skills. Complications that will be discussed is insertion of indwelling urethral catheters, short-term complications that can happen as a result, consequences of long-term indwelling catheters, as well as traumatic removal. For clinical skills, we're going to discuss troubleshooting, obstruction, as well as irrigation. We'll discuss manual irrigation, continuous irrigation, as well we will explore traction of the catheter. The final portion will discuss clinical decision making around urinary tract infections and catheters. Traumatic insertion of urethral catheters. The urethelium is only 3 to 4 cells thick. Approximately 3.2 of 1,000 male hospitalized patients receive a catheter-related injury. Injury can include injury to the urethra, injury to the prostate, injury to the bladder neck, as well as perforation of the bladder. Short-term complications of urethral catheters. There could be ongoing hematuria, which means there is blood coming from somewhere in the GU tract. There can be injury to the prostate. This can lead to prostatitis and increased pain and discomfort for the patient. Patients are at increased risk of having urethral strictures anywhere along the urethra. If there are any injuries to the GU tract during the catheterization, sometimes catheters will have to be remained in place for a longer period of time in order to allow the patient to heal. Paraphimosis. This is when the foreskin is retracted around the glands of the penis and has failed to be put back in place. This leads to increased swelling of the glands as well as the foreskin. It's important that the foreskin is put back in place after catheter care and catheter insertion. Some patients experience difficulty voiding when the catheter is removed. Therefore, they are unable to pass a trial of void and are often sent home with Foley catheters. This exposes them to long-term complications of urethral catheters. Long-term complications of urethral catheters. Women can experience bladder neck injury. Men can experience penile erosion. The longer a catheter is left in place, the higher the risk of incrustation, which prevents ease of removal. Catheters cause chronic irritation of the bladder, which can lead to increased bladder stone formation. Catheters can begin to bypass, causing skin breakdown. The longer a catheter is in, the higher increased chance of bacterial colonization and potential for urosepsis. Traumatic removal of a urethral catheter. There are a few situations in which this happens. Most often it occurs in confused patients. It can also happen when patients are being transferred from say the OR table to their bed. The urinary catheter bag gets forgotten and gets pulled when the patient is moved. The third way in which this can happen is when the balloon fails to deflate during removal. This is called creep. If the balloon does not properly deflate, it's larger than the portion of the membranous urethra. This can cause trauma to the tract and lead to gross hematuria and the need for further catheterization. When a catheter gets removed, it's important to inspect the balloon to ensure that there's not a foreign body left inside the patient. After a traumatic removal, patients rarely require continuous bladder irrigation. It is usually recommended that a 14 French catheter is inserted. This can help tamponade the bleeding. The catheter also allows for the tract to heal. Occasionally, some mild traction may be recommended in order to stop the bleeding. How to prevent traumatic Foley removal. Always ensure a catheter securing device is used and it is positioned properly. There are a few tricks of the trade to prevent patient removal of their catheter. First, you can secure the catheter to the underside of the thigh and then wrap it with clean. This prevents the patients being able to get a good grip of the catheter and being able to yank it out. Another option is that you can put, find some hospital pajama bottoms and put these on the patient. This creates a barrier between them and the catheter. If some of these tricks aren't working, sometimes a decoy catheter can be used. A decoy catheter is secured on top of an adult diaper. This allows the patient to feel like they're grabbing the catheter and relieving some of that irritation. 
Most patients don't purposely try to remove their catheter. It is usually a result of being confused, agitated, and not understanding what is going on. It is critical that you never sedate a patient because they might be at risk of a traumatic Foley removal. Troubleshooting catheter obstruction. There are a few different reasons why a catheter may not be draining. Clot, mucus, bladder stone, incrustation, malposition of the catheter tip. It is important to remember that the patient might have an acute kidney injury and there may be no urine being produced. It's important to assess your patient in order to come to a proper diagnosis. Repositioning of the catheter. You might hear of the quote unquote long catheter sign. This happens when you're examining a male or female and you look at the Foley and you notice that a significant amount of the portion is outside the body. For men, this is usually easier to identify as most of the catheter is within the body. For women, it's a bit difficult just because there's a large external portion of the catheter. If you suspect that the catheter is not in place, a good skill to have is to be able to reposition. In order to reposition a catheter, one should have some lubrication, a syringe, and sterile water. Lubricate the external portion of the catheter. Check to see what size of balloon the catheter has. Ensure that you withdraw the appropriate amount of sterile water. Once this is done, you may push the catheter in towards the patient until the hub meets the skin. When the hub is at the skin, slightly loosen your grip. If the catheter remains in place, this is a good indication that you're in the bladder. Begin to inflate the balloon. If this is difficult or hard, you most likely are not in the right position. Once the balloon's inflated, the catheter should be somewhat mobile and should be able to move at least an inch in each direction. Patients who have recently undergone urological surgery and have had alterations to their urethra, bladder neck, or prostate, it is important to call a urologist before repositioning the catheter. Manual irrigation. Manual irrigation of a catheter is an important skill to have. When you are irrigating a catheter, it is critical to make sure that you are organized and have all the supplies that you will need. You will need an irrigation kit, which usually has a tray, a bulb syringe, gauze, and some forceps in it. You will need a liter of sterile normal saline or water, a Tumi syringe, and soaker pads. A Tumi syringe is a specific type of syringe that has a wide point that allows it to fit into the drainage portion of a catheter. Manual irrigation can be quite a messy business. It's important that you have personal protective gear on. This includes eye protection. Until you become proficient at manual bladder irrigation, it is important that you have extra bedding and soaker pads to ensure that the patient doesn't take an unnecessary bath during the procedure. It's important when you're doing manual irrigation, even if the patient's bladder looks distended, that you instill solution first. This ensures that the end of the catheter is not up against the bladder wall. When you are withdrawing the fluid, it can be expected that there will be a good amount of suction and you'll have to pull moderately hard in order to withdraw fluid. If fluid irrigates in but cannot be extracted, that is a good indication that there is a clog within the system. It's a good measure to irrigate approximately half the bottle of irrigation fluid. This helps ensure that you're making a quick turnover of the fluid that's in the bladder and ensuring that the patient will hopefully not obstruct later in the day. If you cannot extract any fluid, the next step would be to change the catheter. Continuous bladder irrigation. Continuous bladder irrigation is usually used postoperatively for patients who have had surgery, such as a transurethral resection of the prostate. There are a few other indications as well. It is important that the patient has the right type of catheter inserted to allow for continuous bladder irrigation. This is a three-way catheter. There is a drainage port, there is a port for the irrigation to be connected, as well as a drainage bag. There are special types of catheters called hematuria catheters, which have reinforcement within the side of the catheter to allow for passage of debris or clots. 
It's important to know that it only takes a small amount of blood in the urine to make it look quite pink or red. Whenever there's continuous bladder irrigation, there should be an accompanying chart that shows you the corresponding color to blood loss. The irrigation fluid should be titrated, only using enough fluid to allow the urine to look a pale pink in color. There will be often orders to stop continuous bladder irrigation. Usually there will be a designated amount of time and then a urologist will come and look and examine what type of urine is coming from the bladder. This helps decide whether the irrigation needs to continue or whether the patient can be stepped down to manual irrigation as needed. When a patient has continuous bladder irrigation, it is usually assumed that you will no longer be responsible for calculating the patient's output. Ask your staff of whether this is required or not. Traction on a urethral catheter. Just like when you scrape your knee or poke your finger, you can apply pressure and this will have a hemostatic effect. The same principle applies to the bladder neck or prostate. Most often, postoperatively, some urologists will put a catheter under traction. This is either achieved by using pink waterproof tape and pulling the catheter and securing it to the leg so there's a mild amount of pull on the catheter. Some physicians will get a sponge and tie a knot around the catheter. This allows them to cinch up the catheter, allowing for the desirable amount of traction, and then they tie it in a knot. Urethral traction should not be left for longer than eight hours, as this could cause compression to the structures and decrease blood supply. It is important if you see a urethral catheter under traction to know when was it first put under traction and when does it need to be released. The last topic that we're going to discuss is catheter-associated urinary tract infections. When a patient has an indwelling catheter, it's a bit harder to decipher whether they're experiencing some of the common signs of urinary tract infections. One of the most common signs of a urinary tract infection is dysuria, which is painful voiding. This can often be masked when a patient has a catheter in place. A few things you can look for to see if a patient might have a catheter-associated urinary tract infection. The urine could become a bit more cloudy or milky. You could maybe see pieces of mucus or pass within the drainage bag. It's common to have blood in the urine with a urinary tract infection. This may or may not be visible by the naked eye. Patients can often describe pain in the lower abdomen, a feeling of distension or cramping when they're having a lower urinary tract infection. Urine can also bypass around the catheter. This is giving the indication that it may be plugged with mucus. Patients can also become systemically unwell. Fever above 38 degrees Celsius, chills, nausea, vomiting, as well as confusion or change of mental state is often seen in the small children as well as the elderly. Urinary tract infections with recent catheterization. 80% of hospital UTIs are catheter related. The best type of prevention against catheter associated urinary tract infections is not to have a catheter put in the first place unless it is truly needed. There is strong evidence to support that catheters should only remain in for the shortest amount of time possible. The earlier a catheter can be removed, the less likely there is to develop an infection. There have been lots of research around how to decrease the prevalence of catheter related UTIs, and unfortunately there is not a good answer to this yet. Prophylactic antibiotics have not been shown to change in symptomatic urinary tract infections. Symptomatic urinary tract infection is when a parent patient is experiencing symptoms. Many patients who have long-standing catheters will become colonized, and it will appear that they have an active infection based on their urine analysis strips. It is important that we only treat patients who are symptomatic with their urinary tract infection. Urinary tract infection with long-term catheterization. Almost all of these patients will become colonized with multiple different types of bacteria. Pseudomonas and other biofilm bacteria are particularly difficult to treat, and it is nearly impossible to receive resolution of this infection until all foreign bodies are removed from the urinary tract. For most patients, this isn't something that's possible. If you expect your patient has a symptomatic urinary tract infection, it is critical that you always send it for culture and sensitivity.
it is important that we are treating the infection appropriately and not promoting drug resistant bacteria. Antibiotics should only be given when a patient is symptomatic. It is important when a patient has an infowing catheter and they become suddenly ill, not to dismiss urosepsis. In summary, in this video, we discussed complications around insertion of catheters, long-term and short-term complications, as well as traumatic removal of Foley catheters. We've discussed a few of the principles of how to prevent traumatic removal of catheters. It's important to remember that we do not sedate the patient just to decrease the chance of traumatic removal. We've discussed a few catheter skills, including repositioning of the catheter, manual irrigation, continuous bladder irrigation, as well as traction on a urethral catheter. We briefly touched around the clinical decisions around urinary tract infections and catheters. The take home point of this is that a urinary catheter should be removed as soon as clinically indicated in order to prevent urinary tract infections. 